There we go. Um, yeah, so this was really, really, really last minute. So yesterday, actually through Twitter, <laughs> 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 this happened. Uh, so Ross called me. It was on a line that I could hardly hear. He was like, <coughs> we need a speaker. <coughs> Figured, why not, Utrecht, perfect. This morning I was doing a workshop in Amsterdam and just ran out to just be here today with you. Um, I'm Jan, <laughs> indeed, thank you. When I'm, uh, I'm Jan, I'm working as an IoT developer for Telenor Research and Development. Telenor is like, like KPN here. And for the first two years of my career within Telenor, I've been working as a Firefox OS contributor. Telenor paid me to work on like various Mozilla stuff. It's been a freaking amazing journey. Um, in the last year, I've been working on long distance radio, communication stuff, Bluetooth, etc. And I'm starting to appreciate the IoT, the Internet of Things, so much that from January 1st, I'm joining ARM, chipset designers, chipset makers, as developer evangelist IoT. Now, for both these jobs, um, I've been traveling an awful lot. So Utrecht is like a home game for me. Uh, so here's like a little game. Um, I got a photo of myself during a workshop in Bangladesh. And I was hoping you guys, it's a bit hard, it's a bit like a where, where's Waldo, if you could spot me. Anyway, uh, being in, in countries like Bangladesh and being in countries where internet and connectivity uh, are not so common as like here in the Western world, maybe think a bit back to the good old days, right? <laughs> the days where our input methods were essentially the keyboard and the mouse, and that's it. And the output came out of a screen. And after the whole mobile revolution, we're in a completely different world. Sensors are everywhere. The thing is that most developers are a little bit, are still a little bit stuck in, in like thinking that it's 10 years ago. A lot of our applications that we write today do not take this into account. If we build a mobile application, we're really focused on like, oh, a user taps stuff on a screen and then something pops up on the screen and do that again. And I mean, it's not. I can understand that. I mean, if I've been doing that myself as well, and it's because we've never been really taught how to properly use sensors. Like 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, when I was learning to program, when my computer was vibrating, that used to be like an error, a bug. Now my phone is vibrating. That's the interaction that I'm actually expecting. We also had to measure a lot less stuff. Like, how often do you want to measure that someone is taking up his computer and throwing it down? <laughs> Whereas on your mobile phone, you're doing this all the time. I mean, you're, you're taking your phone, you're moving it left and right, you're turning it, you're flipping it, maybe you even throw it in the air. That's all stuff that we can now detect and that we can, that we can build new interactions with. So if you look at like the list of, of sensors on the phone, it's, like, it's, in, it's insane currently. Proximity, accelerometer, ambient light, magnetometer, gyroscope, humidity, ambient temperature, pressure, battery, and cameras. That's just, I mean, and I'm probably missing a few. Actually, the only one, only sensor that I, that I see on this list that I'm actually missing, a band sensor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and all the work that people have been doing into, into sh stuffing more and more sensors into mobile phones led to this other amazing world, the Internet of Things. Every sensor that you connect to your Arduino or that you connect to your embedded project is here because the mobile revolution happened. Because suddenly there was, a billion, there was a market of a billion for gyroscopes and not just a market of a few thousand. The prices dropped like crazy. It's pretty amazing. Like All these sensors allow us to create new interactions and, and create new use cases and new applications where we can have technology talk to us or help us with live or react to interesting stuff happening around us. If you just look at like mobile applications, then there's like a whole bunch of apps that would not have been possible a couple of years ago, and now are all here. 
moves bought by Facebook, um, tracks whatever you're doing throughout the whole day. If you're walking or, or sitting or biking or anything like that, automatically tracks for you. Instant heart rate, you hold your finger on a camera and then based on the pulse of your finger, it generates your heart rate. I mean, just of a simple mobile phone of 100 euros. And sleep cycle that, that use the accelerometer to track how you're sleeping, where you're turning a lot. Amazing, right? Now there is only one, one real problem with this. That stuff is so fucking boring. It's so useful. Useful, useful is a bit boring, I mean, in the sense. I mean, it's so functional. Everything that we see here has been done before. You know, why are we thinking about like completely crazy, new, brilliant stuff? And we're like, like, oh, you sleep better. Oh, big deal. We were at the conference here with the last session. This is not the stuff that we want to hear, right? I mean, the one application that actually got me excited in the past year was this app. And the app was called Send Me to Heaven. An application that you install on your phone, you throw it up in the air, and then a post on Facebook, how high you threw your phone. That is fantastic. <laughs> you know, that's the stuff that I want to see from all these people here. So today, we're going to do something, something fantastic, I think. At least I'm really excited about it. We're going to take a look at a number of sensors that you have in your normal phone today um, and see how we can abuse that to build Interesting interactions. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> so, the device light sensor, um, it's a sensor that you guys all have in your mobile phones, where the real purpose is to adjust the brightness of your screen. Pretty useful, I mean, you're sitting in the sun, you want your screen to be brighter. You're laying in bed tender tindering, then you want your screen not so bright because otherwise your partner wakes up and, you know. <laughs> um, then I was watching an old episode of The Big Bang Theory, and I saw Sheldon play around with a theremin. And a theremin is a musical instrument where you move your hands through a wave and thus generating music. And I figured, if I move my hands in front of a light sensor, some light blocks, some lights get through. If I feed that into like in an oscillator, a tone generator, I can basically make music by just waving my hands above my phone. So what we can do is we use web audio Web audio has an oscillator function, which basically generates a tone at a certain frequency. But then we can modify the frequency that modify the frequency based on the number of lumen that falls into the light sensor. If we combine this with enough phones, we can have a whole array that we can basically play like this and make interesting music. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, guys, but I'm going to show you that it actually works later. <laughs> Um, second thing. <laughs> I was told to keep it a bit light. <laughs> Accelerometer. The real purpose, for example, one of the real purposes is turn to mute. Accelerometer measures the forces that are being applied on your phone. So when your phone is flat on the table, it measures gravity pulling. But if you flip it over, it now measures that gravity is like, has like a negative gravity, negative 9.81. So if you phone and you flip it over, it's pretty easy to detect. You can turn to mute. But I figured if my phone can measure the forces that are being applied on the z-axis, then when I throw a phone in the air, then at some point, no extra acceleration is provided. That's the moment that it just goes to the top and then falls down. So I could use this to detect whether a phone is in the air or not. So if I have a multiple of those, I can actually make a juggling visualizer. Really easy, just plot the values of the z-axis and we start juggling, get a nice visualization. Four lines of code, really. <laughs> so the first time that I uh, showed these two examples, or the second time, and it was at a workshop that I did in Budapest, and someone actually said, well, I got a brilliant idea, and he made a weight scale out of his phone. So what he did, he, was, he, he took like a soft surface, he put his phone on it, and the gyroscope measures like tilt. For example, on this axis, puts x grams on one side, measures how much the tilt is, then he calibrated it, and by then, you just put a bunch of coins on one side, and now we can tell you the actual weight. 
<laughs> this is just, <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay, so um, the gyroscope. The real purpose of this is, uh, oh, I rotate your screen. <laughs> when, I, when I flip my phone over like this, I want my phone in landscape right now. Um, during a hackathon two weeks ago, uh, um, I wanted to do something with machine learning. Now we figured we can use the gyroscope data of your phone because it's in your pocket anyway. So we um, got a live feed of the data. We got a feed of the data, 50 minutes in total, where we just measured the data on the gyroscope. Then I walked five minutes, I sat five minutes, and I danced five minutes. Then that data we just tagged, we fed into a super easy machine learning uh, model based on uh, Sci scikit-learn, Python library. And we can use that to live classify movement. When I started dancing, the data from my phone uh, got sent into the model, and then it could like tag, oh, you're doing this, or you're doing that. Literally, built in 24 hours. I'm gonna show this all later, holy shit. <laughs> but can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine that you come home to your to your wife or your husband tonight? You're like, honey, here's a phone, put it in your front pocket and please start dancing. I'm training my machine learning out my machine learning model. <laughs> um one step further, I mean we can use the theremin, but the theremin is in, in, in essence a pretty basic and boring instrument. I mean, it's one tone. What if you can like do it like a bit further? What if you can like properly generate music? Um, this was my biggest revelation of the year. There is a, a thing called algo raves, and these are people that actually do this for a living. What they do, they go into a club, like an actual club with people dancing. They put their computer on stage, and they start live coding music and video, and people are actually going completely berserk in the club. I mean, if there was one sign that we needed that nerds are really taking over the world, <laughs> then it's this. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Just started three years ago by Alex McLean. Um, the thing is, I don't know shit about music or about visuals. And luckily, uh, Charlie Roberts, a PhD from UCSB in the US, decided to create Jibber, which is a live coding uh, environment for algo raves. So what it gives is you is, is like a DSL, a bit based on JavaScript, where you can just say, okay, give me a drum loop with basically these notes and give me some strings and vary them like this, and then automatically music pops up. You can also do that for visuals. So here's a simple example of how you can write some music in Jibber. So here I got a drums with a certain pattern. Now I can add a little pitch. Um, or I can even do stuff like uh, vocoding. Uh, <laughs> so if you look at this, <laughs> if you look if you look at the code here, it's it's programming. But still, the guy in front of the audience or in front of the front of the crowd decides on the variables. I mean, pitch is 70 and word cap is five. But why is he the one to decide? You know, why can't we democratize the dance floor a bit more? So, <laughs> I figured, what is else on 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 like a concert except for music? All this shit on the phones. Everyone is standing there with their phones in their hand, like trying to make trying to make videos. And what do phones have? What have we just like decided? Phones have sensors. Sensors, sensors, and more sensors. <laughs> There's thousands of sensors waiting to be abused in a concert hall. <laughs> so uh, what I figured is what if we can get the data of all those phones, pump it through a web service that aggregates all that data, and then feeds that into the music generating algorithm. So if the whole crowd decides that they want to flip their phone this side, music go a bit slower. Right turn, all the way up. You know, this is so cool. You can like totally interact with your audience. Um, so how we can do that, I'm going to show you a demo. 
Basically, we say we generate some stuff, and then we can say, oh, the pitch is no longer a set variable. It depends on what the people in the audience think it should be, based on the phone data. One step further. <laughs> We're not going to stop here anytime yet. Getting data out of the real world. You know, Still, all the examples that I showed you are like from the phone. It's the sensors that come with the phone. Now let's do it the other way and have some real world data push some data to us. So what we have is now the new thing, Bluetooth beacons. Who have who've heard about Bluetooth beacons? Oh, that's a lot. Very good. Um, Bluetooth beacons are pretty stupid in the sense that they just sit at a certain place and they say, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Um, but actually, then you think, well, if it just says, I'm here every second, and still is like a long battery life and it's pretty cheap, we can abuse it for all kinds of super interesting data. We, we could like broadcast sensor values or broadcast UIDs or use it to push advertisements. But if we have enough beacons, we could actually use it to build like a baby monitor. <laughs> so I put a beacon there, I put a beacon there, I put a beacon there. Use Tag the baby with a phone. <laughs> then use some triangulation to find out, based on uh, signal strength, where the baby is. And the nice thing, when the baby escapes, sell myself an alarm. <laughs> um, you might be thinking, OK, so really cool, but now I need everyone to install my application for this. And uh, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> so that's really funny because I have an electric fence and I need a volunteer. <laughs> so you might be thinking like, okay, so, so, but now I need to install it in my app and I need to write all this Android code and, oh man. Now here's the cool thing, web Bluetooth, so the ability to read beacons is coming to web browsers. <laughs> it's coming to web browsers, guys, shit. We can properly interact with the real world just from our browser. Um, Chrome is going to have it from Chrome 45 or Chrome 46. Firefox is uh, in Firefox OS, Mozilla's operating system. It's already there. It's also coming to Firefox for Android. It's coming to Chrome for iOS. This is really cool. This is like a game changer. So how can I scan for these beacons? You get an adapter. You get a reference to the Bluetooth adapter. It's subject to getting permission. You say, start a low energy scan. For some reason, they decided to have this API speak French. <laughs> um, when a device is found, we get a scan record, which is basically 30 bytes that you can, you can put anything in there. Uh, and at the end, we say, stop the scan. Now, <laughs> let's scan. Um, Google figured, like, if we have 30 bytes that we can basically fill however we like, then why not put a URL in there? And that's their idea of, like, a physical web. Discoverability of IoT devices is going to be a bigger and bigger problem. I mean, at this point, when my fridge is smart, I'm pretty super excited about that, and I figure I installed the app for my fridge. But the moment that this screen is going to be smart, and your chair is going to be smart, and those lamps are going to be smart, and everything is connected, like how, how would I even discover that these devices are around me and that I can control them? So Google figured, uh, if we put beacons on all of these things, and these beacons, we make them broadcast a URL, then suddenly si very tiny devices or smart devices can broadcast their existence through a generic interface. Why not get everything a URL? And it can show up in your home screen. This is coming to Chrome for Android. This is going to be in, in hundreds of millions of phones. This is what people are going to use to discover new devices around them. Got to be ready for this, right? This is cool. So if I look at this, this is a beacon. This is the next newest generation of beacons. It's literally, it's freaking nothing. And the only thing in here is essentially a battery. You can buy these for $4 right now from Alibaba. You know, get them, stick them on stuff, suddenly everything gets a URL. 
So what we did, for example, in our office is we tagged every meeting room with a beacon. So whenever you're standing in front of the meeting room and you figure, okay, so the meeting room looks empty, but is it going to stay like that? It's a problem that a lot of people in corporates have at least. Um, the app integrates with Google Calendar. So I tap it, I see Google Calendar, I see, oh, the next 15 minutes is free. Click, book it. An example from Google is, well, what is parking meters at URLs? So I see a parking meter, I don't need to figure, okay, so which app do I need to use here to install? No, you click on the link, like you pay, it reflects on the parking meter and you're done. It's a super easy way of like getting stuff through your smart. I mean, I have a beacon. <laughs> Actually, this beacon just broadcast my existence. The nice thing about that is that because no one else has beacons, um, when I'm in a bar and I'm standing like and I'm drinking a beer and someone else someone just manages to pull up the physical web device, they'll see like, oh, Jan Jungbaum, I'm the nice guy at the bar, please come talk to me. Totally not freaky. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to do something with that, this is the development board for these beacons. Nordic Semiconductor NRF 51 DK. I've said that so many times that I can now mesmerize it. Um, it costs 60, 70 euros just for the dev board. The chip on it itself is two euros. You can program it to a web IDE, web interface. Just write some code like, oh, I want this, this has to be a beacon, this has to be this, this has to be that. Be done with that. The cool thing here is that this chip is basically being used by every smart device around you. From the little beacon to the drone I have here. Um, and that gives for some interesting opportunities because if physical web can give ordinary objects a URL, a web interface, so you like, if you combine that with web Bluetooth, which allows us to talk to ordinary Bluetooth devices straight from the browser, we can give this drone a URL. So instead of having to install the, the Parrot Rolling Spider app, I search for devices around me, I see that this drone has a URL. And then from a web application, I can actually connect to the drone and fly it. It allows me to discover the, not only discover the drone, but also straight get a reference and actually control it. You go from, from discovery to flying a drone in seven seconds rather than, oh, yeah, shit, what's the manufacturer? Um, where do you get the app? Oh, uh, whatever. We can fly a drone from the browser. Damn, that's cool. Um, I'm not going to go through this at this point because I want to go to demos. Because it's freaky, it's five. It's five past five, actually. I see you guys are all like, damn it. When does this guy stop talking? I want to see him juggle phones. Um, so, got all the. Yeah. <laughs> After the first presentation that I ever gave where I did all the live demos and everything went wrong, I uh, said to myself, Jan, you're never going to do any live demos anymore. And suddenly you're standing here with like 20 minutes to fill and a bunch of phones and what the hell can go wrong? So that's why this slide. <laughs> and I'm going to show you some cool shit. First thing I'm going to do is switch over my display so you can see what I'm seeing. Here we go. Um, what I have here, the first thing I want to do is, is show you my Theremin interface. What I have here is two Firefox OS phones. Don't have to be Firefox OS, can be basically any phone. But what I want to do here is I read the device light data from the sensor. Uh, I send it to my computer, and my computer is then going to make some music based on that. So, let's open up this thing. Let's open up both of them. And let's open a web page because we use web audio. So, at this moment, we don't hear anything yet. Um, I'm going to put it a little bit lower because this can be freaking annoying. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start one of them. Oh, what? Yeah, wait. 
but I can have two. I need this other phone up. Sorry. Okay. So now I have another one here, and because the oscillator can like do it on like different stuff, or, like different tone generating stuff, I can have different music pretty. <laughs> Just so ridiculous. Thank you! Yes! That's nice. Um, so, next thing that I want to show you is that I can also visualize juggling with these phones. <laughs> uh, yeah, I see. So, um, actually, if I open the device motion app, this is the motion that's currently going over the z-axis. I mean, not much is happening. It's basically balancing at 9.81, which is gravity. If I move it a bit up or it down, you see little variations. Um, but the nice thing is, is that when I have two phones that are doing the same thing, is that when I put one up, you can pretty easily spike. And the other one. So if I do this, it's pretty easy to actually detect which one is up and which one is down. Pretty amazing. And of course, that gets super interesting the moment that I... Gonna throw phones in the air. So, because what I want to... So if I do this, do that. What the interesting part here is, is uh, the three or four dots that you see here at the bottom. Because that's the moment that basically no acceleration is being applied. That's the moment just before it hits the top and then falls down. And that is really cool if you have two devices. And that's what I'm going to do now. As you might see, one already has a cracked screen. I have the weirdest job ever. <laughs> um, so something I want to show you as well. Um, I have the, um, the model that I trained with 15 minutes of data. As I said before, I put the phone in my pocket over a WebSocket. I streamed live data from the gyroscope to my machine learning application. Um, so what I have here is a trained model not just based on my data, but also based on the data from, another, from a bunch of other people. Um, and when I start doing stuff based on this, it live classifies this. That means that I have to walk like other people have also walked, because that's how the model learns, <laughs> and dance like other people have danced, because that's also how the model learned. So let me go to the page. Um, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, so I'm going to put it in my front pocket. After five seconds, you see some measurements started coming in. All right, so at this moment, I'm sitting slash standing. The model can't really distinguish between those two. But now, holy fuck, is this cool or is this cool? <laughs> no way. <laughs> So now I'm standing, but what if I start dancing? <laughs> the weirdest thing I actually learned from this model is um, <laughs> one of my coworkers trained the model by <laughs> dancing a bit um, extravagant, <laughs> and he did this. <laughs> and at some point, if I hit it at like the right spot, <laughs> Hey! <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, all right. So, <laughs> we've seen it dancing. Now let's also add some music, because otherwise it looks completely ridiculous. Um, 
so I used Jibber to um, write like a little music generating algorithm for you guys. You know? Sounds okay, but right. I mean, there's no audience interaction here yet. So when I connect to this thing, this is my dot. I can now influence the music. Or put like a lot of echo in it. I think that's cool. But we can also add visuals. You're like, oh, now I wanna be a bit more relaxed. Or I wanna be relaxing but a bit rich. Or I wanna like add a little bit of tempo in it. And then I figured <laughs> one thing more. So I wrote uh, <laughs> a little um, GIF player that can now adjust to the music as well. So this is my good friend. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you know, it's okay, but it's a bit slow. But watch if I go all the way out. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, now it's time to get out uh, the beacons. So I showed you this one, really tiny one. Um, I got a bunch more here. ST mode beacons. Um, and I want to show you how you can do indoor positioning with those, through a simple web application, actually. So let's open up my baby monitor. Um, let's first actually put these beacons here. So. We're going to create a 3x3 three three field where our baby is allowed to go. So that is here. Now I'm going to put this device is going to act as the baby. Just they didn't allow me to actually bring a real baby up on stage. So now it's connected, and um, it's going to scan for all the beacons around it and send like the signal strength back to the computer where it can like show you. So as you can see, um, only one of the it's really jittery every now and then. I mean, like at some point, I think it's like five meters, then I think it's like two meters, then I think it's like, you know, whatever. So. If you want to reduce the jitter a bit, what we can do is like buffer the RSSI. I mean, you want to like flatten it out a bit. So at this moment, the beacon send out every second, so it's not too crazy. Um, so now it like gives a bit more of an interesting thing. And now if we do intersections, because that's what you do with triangulation, it basically gives us like three points, and it's probably more or less there. So if like the average, then the average should pretty much tell me where the where the phone is at this point. So if I move it all the way here, there's a couple seconds delay because we've got the buffering uh, on. But you can see that based on the field, that we're slowly, in a couple of seconds, that we're actually moving there. So we can use three super inexpensive beacons for a couple of euros each to pretty good like detect where we are in a physical space. If I put it here in the middle. That's nice too. So now we'll move there in the middle. And then I figured, like, why can't we use the stuff that we just did with music generation and create some baby generated music? <laughs> so <laughs> instead of how I hold my phone, um, I'm actually going to put the position of, uh, well, that's far off. <laughs> As I said, it's not perfect yet. <laughs> Let me just put it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you how that works in a sec. So, okay, now we're back at normal. Sometimes this happens. It's a big room. So, what if we can like add some music to what the baby is currently doing? Um, so that we're going to do right now. 
So when the baby is in its space, we can have nice, relaxing music. That was a bit too fast. Oh. Give it a couple of seconds to actually like go within the border again. So now when I move it a bit, Depending like if it moves throughout the border, when it goes back in, it should start relaxing the music a bit. Baby is safe, there's not a problem. <sighs> he can just continue working. <laughs> and when I move the thing out, you can just listen to this while you're working. When I move it out, at some point it detects that the intensity of the music goes up. You can stop programming, just run downstairs and save your baby. <laughs> I didn't say it was perfect. <laughs> well, here we go. <laughs> Almost. Good enough. <laughs> okay, let's leave it at this. Uh <laughs> So actually, the really, really, really last thing that I want to show you today is um, the drone. So you might be thinking, okay, a guy showing a drone on stage, yeah, who the fuck cares? I mean, I've seen a drone. True. But please remember that this is all using the, uh, the new web APIs that, we that we've added to Firefox. It uses physical web to detect the drone, and then it uses an ordinary web application to fly it. There's not a single app installed on this phone that can fly it. We can, we can discover devices around this and we can then control them simply by using the web because of the new APIs that have been added. Like if you keep that in mind, then this demo gets like a lot more interesting. <laughs> so when I tap the link, it goes to rollingspider.xyz, it asks me to flip my phone. Um, and I'm in uh, a web interface, a simple normal website, nothing installed. And it allows me to now fly the thing by just pressing a takeoff button. Woo! <laughs> Remind you, this is all JavaScript. <laughs> Not to make you any, uh, you know. Now, here's the cool thing this thing can actually flip. <laughs> Let me try if this actually works, uh, guys. Oh! <laughs> oh! I actually had a backup video, you know, just in case. <laughs> but here, I mean, this is the end of, of not only this presentation, it's also the end of today, DOM code. Um, I think that what you showed today does encourage you to just like get out an old phone. Um, get out your Arduino with a bunch of sensors. Just start thinking about, like, what if we not just like read books and and build whatever they say in there? But we start thinking a bit outside of the box. Like, what kind of crazy things that can we do if suddenly we can interact with the whole world around this? You know, you don't have to throw your phone in the air if you don't really want to. You don't have to crush your drone here on stage if you don't really want to. But there's so much cool stuff happening right now in the whole IoT space and with phones and new sensors that get added every single day, you know? Dealing with this kind of stuff, even if it's like the little things, like blinking an LED, it's something that you change in the real world. And that got me so excited again. It was like I was like 15 or 10 or 15 years ago, I was sitting by my computer and like, what's your name? Hello, Jan. You know, and showing that to your mom. That's the feeling that I get when doing stuff like this. So. Get your stuff out, go hacking, and with that, thank you. Um, I have no clue if there's type of questions. <laughs> Other questions? What kind of beer do you like? I want to buy a bunch of bottles for you is a very valid question. Uh, if I would want a um, simple 
Firefox OS device to start playing around with? What's a good recommendation? Um, at this moment, none, because there's no Firefox OS devices being sold at this point. Um, actually, all the demos that I've showed today are also running on Firefox for Android and Chrome for Android. There's nothing specific about Firefox OS. So if you, if you want to start hacking on any of this, just get a cheap Android phone and be done with it. At some point, Firefox OS will come available again, I hope. At this point, you can't buy it anywhere. Um, can we get like a microphone because... Yes, but all the cool stuff you can't really do here because it doesn't come with the Gecko browser. So we, are, we have to respect whatever Safari integrates. So if Safari doesn't integrate by Bluetooth right now, it's not in Firefox for iOS either. Then I have another question. Um, the Bluetooth beacon devices, how do they broadcast their uh, address? Is the address pointing to the beacon or is um, it pointing to another website? They're point, no. So at least with Eddystone or URI beacons, the, the stuff that we use for physical web, Actually, in their advertisement package, the 30 bytes that they broadcast every second, in there, the URL is encoded. So there's no external service. I mean, you can even read them without internet access. Okay, and is the, the, the URL, is it running on the device? How? No. No, it's, I mean, it's just a URL. If you want to interact with the device later on, you need to have a web application at that URL that can connect over Bluetooth to the device. The question is, can you reprogram these beacons with new URLs? Um, yes. Actually, programming new URLs is really easy because most of them come with a configuration setting. So you pop out the battery, pop it back in, and for 60 seconds, you can reconf reconfigure them. Um, with the Nordic Semiconductor Development Kit, in most of these uh, beacons, even like the cheap $4 ones, you can connect the debug pins to the developer board and then use this as external programmer. So you can even change completely what type of beacon it is, which is really, really powerful. Hi. Um, th those beacons that transmit uh, URLs, yep. uh, do you think these will take off instead of QR codes? Because QR codes are stupid? Um, I certainly hope so. Um, this Tuesday, at the Chrome Developer Summit, so next Tuesday, uh, Scott Jensen from Google, the guy that's behind the physical web, is going to announce that physical web is going to come to Chrome stable, both for iOS and for Android. So that means that suddenly hundreds of millions of people are going to be able to see, like, oh, there's like six devices around you, and then tap it and like, like see where, where they lead to. And I hope that that generates enough uptake to, um, to actually make this take off, because I think it's an amazing a show of like what the mobile web can do and why mobile web um, can take an advantage over native applications in, in, in stuff like this. I have no, I can't even see hands or something from here. It's just a big light in my face. <laughs> what kind of, jeez. Oh, <laughs> what kind of security, like, it, it seems like if you can just connect all these things, what kind of security protocols and, and what not are replace? Um, at this point, in all this Bluetooth low energy stuff is basically no security in place. The, the biggest security is like, okay, you can't reconfigure this device because you need to like physically have access to it and open it and pop out the battery and pop it back in um, and do that. But um, there's no security in place. That has its benefits because security adds overhead, which we don't really want in these beacons. Um, beacons are in general also read only, I mean, they only broadcast. Um, but no, at this point, no, no security in place there. If you want to have security on the underlying service, like for example, our meeting rooms require you to log in with a Google account first, that's totally possible, but it's not built into the protocol. Uh, two questions. How does this relate to iBeacons, and what does this also mean for NFC? Um, iBeacons are essentially, so a beacon, just says like, okay, uh, you're gonna broadcast something and you got 30 bytes to do it, 31 bytes. iBeacon said, okay, so in those 31 bytes, we're gonna encode a UUID, a major, and a minor number. That means that um, there's someone that owns the registry, essentially, and Apple really wants to be that. 
in Eddystone or URI beacons, we just said instead of encoding like proprietary IDs, we just encode a URL because URLs don't discriminate. But hardware-wise, iBeacons and Eddystone URI beacons are exactly the same. You just have a different protocol when uh, transmitting. And your second question was? So what does it mean for NFC? I think NFC and Bluetooth Low Energy are uh, complementary. So for example, the problem that I just said with like configuring devices, it would be really nice if like with a tap of NFC, we can go into configuration mode. Uh, Nordic Semiconductors, the maker of the Bluetooth chip that everyone uses, is actually adding NFC to their next generation in the same format. So I'm expecting that all beacons in a year and a half and two years will combine NFC and Bluetooth. And that I think it generates some really cool opportunities of like having N super near field communication and medium range communication. Is there any more questions? I see someone running up. Uh, how good is the signal from the Bluetooth devices? Can I hide them, f for example, behind a closet or something? Um, yeah, so they don't have like a set power that they send out. You can configure that. Um, so if you want something only to be visible within five meters or something, you set the transmission power really low. The nice thing is also that that gives you like extra battery power. But for example, the ST modes, which is like a commercially available uh, solution, have an app. You can just over the using the app, you can connect and like set stuff like transmission power, etc. The maximum range of these is um, about 70 meters, but it depends a bit on like the room that you're in. So, for example, from here to the end of the room, no problem. If you want to go through people, for example, that hurts. Uh, if you want to go through buildings or whatever, also hurts performance. But yeah, anywhere between 10 and 70. You s you tell it's a uh, quite long battery life, but what what do you think in years, in in ten years, or what? Uh um, mm. These ones, the super small ones, they have like a a coin cell, but a really flat one. I think 100 milliamp uh, hours. They do for seven months. Um, these have a bigger battery. They run about three years, depending on like your transmission power. Um, so that's a bit of the range. If you want to have stuff that you actually deploy like for a long time, and you stick two AA batteries on it, you get to like 10 years because that's the moment that the AA batteries are degraded. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, pretty pretty low, pretty low capacity. Um, if you guys have like more questions, because I think for some people it's also going to be boring if there's 14 questions left. Um, I'm also going to be around later, so don't feel pressure to like ask it right now. <laughs> See, that worked. <laughs> All right, then I really want to thank you and I want to get the organizers of Domcode here on stage again with me. Thank you.